Welcome back to Astronomy. This is Chapter 17, Star Stuff, and this Part 2 video will look at the life of a high-mass star. In the picture, you see what's called an X-ray bubble. It's a very hot bubble of plasma, and it's what comes from the explosion of a high-mass star when it's come to the very end of its life. So we'll be talking about this as we go through this video. Life as a high-mass star, goals for learning what are the life stages of a high-mass star, how do high-mass stars make the elements necessary for life, and how does a high-mass star die? As you think about the main sequence on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, remember that there are below the reds, there are brown dwarf stars, and then low-mass stars are stars that have less than two solar masses, so that takes us up the main sequence past the sun about to right here we have intermediate mass stars which are between two and eight solar masses and then high mass stars everything beyond that so in this video we're looking at the life of stars from this point on eight solar masses on at the end of the video i'm going to tie in the life of intermediate mass stars. That'll be a quick little tie-in, but most of this video is going to face on, uh, is going to focus on high mass stars. Remember, back to chapter 16, when we looked at the birth of stars, that most stars are low mass stars. So as you look at this, low mass stars, remember, being less than two solar masses, and so the 77% plus 19%, so about 96% of stars are low mass stars. Intermediate mass stars are between two and eight solar masses, and this chart doesn't exactly break it down like that. This uh, part just says from two to 10, but that's roughly the realm of intermediate mass stars. That's gonna be about 4% of stars. And a very, very small, major uh, small minority of stars are high mass stars. So basically this bit in here, about 0.4%. So this video, you have to understand, on high mass stars is really talking about a very small minority of stars. Let's think about when a high mass star is still on the main sequence. I've shown you in chapter 15 that the more massive the star, the shorter its lifetime. And part of that comes from the fact that there are multiple nuclear fusion processes going on in the core of that star. So you've already learned back to chapter 14, when you learned about the sun, that there is the proton-proton chain, which is how hydrogen is turned directly into helium inside a star. But there's another way that a high mass star can turn hydrogen to helium, and it's called the CNO cycle. So the CNO cycle, which I'm about to describe, and the proton-proton chain together are two separate processes. So it's going to burn through the fuel more quickly because it has different ways of fusing the hydrogen. High mass main sequence stars fuse hydrogen to helium using C, N, and O, so carbon, nitrogen, oxygen as catalysts. The greater core temperature enables hydrogen nuclei to overcome greater repulsion. Let's go through the CNO cycle. It's a cycle, so we can uh, start just about anywhere, but it makes most sense to start here at the top, step one. And here's a hydrogen-1 nucleus. It encounters carbon-12 nucleus, and it fuses with it, gives off some energy, and it becomes nitrogen-13. Now, nitrogen-13 is an unstable isotope, so it in short time will decay into carbon-13. Another hydrogen comes along, fuses with the carbon-13, and it makes nitrogen-14. Nitrogen-14 is a stable isotope of nitrogen. In fact, in every breath that you take in, most of the air molecules are nitrogen, and that nitrogen is nitrogen-14. So this is what you're breathing in, in addition to oxygen and uh, other lesser uh, molecules that are in the air. So nitrogen-14 fuses with hydrogen-1 and it becomes oxygen-15. Oxygen-15 is very short-lived. It has a half-life of only about two minutes. 
It's what's used in medical applications in PET scans, positron emission tomography scans. So in very short time, it decays, and it becomes nitrogen-15. Here comes another hydrogen. It fuses with the nitrogen-15. When it fuses, it becomes carbon-12, and it kicks off a helium nucleus, otherwise known as an alpha particle. And so we've brought it around the cycle, and it's carbon-12 again. Now this carbon-12 can meet up with another hydrogen, and the cycle starts again. But you look at what went into it. You had a hydrogen go into it, another hydrogen, another hydrogen, another hydrogen, four hydrogens, and what came out of it? A helium-4. So the overall reaction of the CNO cycle is that four hydrogens went in to become a helium, which is the same as the overall reaction for the proton-proton chain. Well, now let's look at life stages of a high-mass star. Late life stages of a high-mass star are similar to those of low-mass stars. So when it's on the main sequence, it has hydrogen fusion in its core. And then when it uses up all the hydrogen, it's all become helium. Then it becomes not a giant, but a supergiant. So it just goes farther up on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And it has the hydrogen shell around the helium core that is fusing into helium. And you saw this same process in my previous video looking at a low mass star. And then that hydrogen shell around the helium core that's fusing is pushing down with such extreme temperature and pressure on the helium core that the helium core starts fusing into carbon. The entire star at this point is a supergiant. High mass stars make the elements necessary for life. So inside a high mass star, while it's in the supergiant phase, uh, you have these other elements being formed. And so you have carbon and helium, and they can combine become, to become oxygen. You have oxygen and helium, they can combine to become neon 20. Neon and helium can combine to become magnesium. And these are all what's called helium capture reactions. So inside stars is where, as the previous screen said, uh, elements necessary for life are created. This is why the author of the textbook, titled Chapter 17, Star Stuff, it doesn't simply mean that this chapter is stuff about stars, but rather the implication is that all the things around you, including the atoms in your body, are stuff that comes from stars. All your atoms were once inside stars. And so hydrogen, helium, the two simple elements, they were made in the initial, uh, the beginnings of the universe, what we refer to as the Big Bang. It made uh, a universe of about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. All other elements are made inside stars. So helium fusion, as I showed on the previous screen, can make carbon, even in low mass stars. That's what happens when it becomes a giant. The helium in the core fuses to carbon. The CNO cycle can change carbon into nitrogen and oxygen. And then we have this uh, previous screen that I showed you. Here it is again, helium capture. The high core temperatures inside high mass stars allow helium to fuse with heavier elements. Helium capture builds carbon into oxygen, neon, magnesium, and other elements. Remember back to my previous video on low mass stars. The end of a low mass star is when that helium core has all fused and it becomes carbon. And I said that the carbon isn't going to fuse into a heavier element because it's just not hot enough. Well, in high mass stars, the core temperature is high enough to have heavier elements fusing. So inside these high mass stars, you can have such fusion processes as the three that are shown here. Carbon and oxygen can fuse together to make silicon. 
oxygen can fuse with another oxygen to make sulfur. Silicon and silicon can fuse to make iron. And there are many other examples, but you, these are just the three shown. The point is that inside high mass stars, when they are supergiants, you have all these heavier elements that can be formed. So advanced reactions in stars make elements like silicon, sulfur, calcium, and iron. This is what it looks like inside a supergiant. It is the multiple shell burning that you learned about with a low mass star, but there are many, many shells. And so in this tiny core, you've got, let's start at actually the outside. You have non-fusing hydrogen. So the outer shell, uh, just uh, it's hydrogen that's not up to 10 million Kelvin. It's not going to fuse. But then look at the uh, gray. Actually, that was the, the dark gray. The light gray, hydrogen fusing into helium. And then inside that, the pink, helium is fusing into carbon. And then this um, uh, darker color here, the carbon is fusing into heavier elements. The green, it just says fusion of oxygen, ne neon, and magnesium. So what you've got inside a high mass star that has now become a supergiant is these different layers of shells that are all fusing. With all this fusion going on, nuclear fusion, it's pushing out with great pressure that's making the star expand. It's also pushing in and adding to the pressure on those lower layers that's causing them to fuse. So what happens is that uh, you've got a core, and here it says an iron core, but through the life of the supergiant, the core, it was helium, and then it was carbon. That's actually where the life story of a low mass star ended. And then as soon as all of the core, the carbon has fused uh, into oxygen, the core will momentarily shut down. It'll stop producing. And since it's no longer pushing out against gravity, the star will contract, it'll get smaller. It'll then, in getting smaller, push down on the core, heat it up, and that oxygen core will come to life again. And the star will start to expand until all the oxygen fuses into neon, and then the core will shut down. And then the star will contract until it presses down on the neon core enough to fuse it into the next heavier element. So this supergiant is doing this accordion effect of getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. Every time the core runs through all its fuel, the star gets smaller until the core starts up again and then the star expands. The core goes through a progression of elements, but the very last element is always iron. Once all of the core is iron, it's going to shut down. The nuclear fusion is going to shut down for the last time. The star will contract onto that iron core, but it cannot get hot enough to fuse iron into heavier elements. That is where it ends for the star. And in a very little bit, I'll talk about what happens on that final once the core shuts down for the last time. Helium capture is uh, the various processes I showed on a previous screen where helium fuses to different elements. And so, for example, carbon fuses with helium. Carbon, remember, is number six with six protons. Helium has two protons, so when they fuse together, it makes oxygen that has eight protons. It skips over the odd-numbered element, number seven, which is nitrogen. Then oxygen, which is number eight, fuses with helium and becomes element number 10, skipping over the odd number element number nine. And so one of the evidence we see that this happens throughout the stars in the galaxy is that there are higher abundances of elements with even numbers of protons, just because those are so often formed inside stars. So this shows relative abundance of atoms of different atomic numbers, which is the number of protons. And so we have helium, which is number two, and lithium, beryllium, boron, there's low abundance of those. But then the pattern starts with carbon, number six. 
and not as much nitrogen, number seven, more oxygen, number eight, not as much of number nine, then more of number 10. And you see this zigzagging pattern. So nature has a way of creating and having a preference for creating even numbered elements, and it's due to this helium capture. This is the life track of a high mass star as it goes into the supergiant phase. And so we see something like this one, it goes to the right, and then it's gonna do this zigging and zagging as it gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. And so you can see those various life tracks. How a high mass star dies. This is what's called a supernova remnant. This one in particular is called the Crab Nebula. Remember I said that in the core, once the core gets up to iron, element number 26, that's it. There's not gonna be any more nuclear fusion. So the iron builds up in the core until degeneracy pressure can no longer resist gravity. Gravity crushes down the entire star onto that core. The core then suddenly collapses, creating a supernova, which is a great explosion of the star. What happens is all those outer layers of the star, they collapse into the core. They rebound outward, and that makes the big explosion. What you're looking at here, which is the, the same picture I started this video with, is called an X-ray bubble or a hot bubble. And it's that material exploding out from the star. So you're looking at what is mostly the outer layers, except for the core of the star, just going out in all directions. It's very energetic. And so the temperature is in the millions of Kelvin. So that's why it's called an X-ray bubble because giving off millions of Kelvin, it can be seen well in the X-ray. But what happens to the core is also very interesting. Core degeneracy pressure goes away because the electrons combine with the protons. So in an earlier video, I think this goes back to chapter 16, when I was explaining the birth of stars, uh, when I was talking about brown dwarfs, you have this degeneracy pressure, which is electrons jammed up against each other, pushing against each other, and that's what holds up under gravity. However, this gravity is so strong when this, car, when this star collapses that the core degeneracy pressure just gives up. You're jamming those electrons together so tightly, they can't withstand the gravity. They actually combine with protons. They get squished together with protons. Here you have an electron joining with a proton, and they become neutrons. And a little particle gets kicked off called a neutrino. So what you have left, what used to be a core of iron, which was protons with electrons, um, and there were neutrons as well, it's all just one ball of neutrons. So the neutrons collapse to the center, forming what's called a neutron star. The energy and neutrons released in a supernova enable the elements heavier than iron to form, including silver, gold, and uranium. So in this supernova, what is getting pushed out in this explosion is it's such a highly energetic event that there is enough energy to fuse those heavier elements. And so all these heavier elements than iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, silver, gold, all those that you see on the periodic table, heavier than number 26, these are created in that explosive event known as the supernova. So there's a picture of a supernova remnant, another X-ray bubble. The energy released by the collapse of the core drives the star's outer layers into space. This is the Crab Nebula. It was a bright light seen in the sky in the year AD 1054. So this very bright light was observed. Astronomers around the world recorded and wrote about it, and it lasted for a few weeks, a bright light that rivaled the brightness of the full moon. A supernova, the explosion of a single star, is as bright as an entire galaxy. Typical brightness is about 10 billion solar luminosities. If you think to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, 
up the vertical axis, it went 10 to the fourth, which is 10,000 solar luminosities, 10 to the fifth, and I think it maxed out at the top of the chart at 10 to the sixth, a million times the luminosity of the sun. A single supernova is many, many times brighter than that, 10 billion times the brightness of the sun. As I wrote there at the top there, a supernova is as bright as a galaxy. So they're very easy to detect, even in galaxies far, far away. If a galaxy has a supernova anywhere in it, from our perspective, the galaxy will approximately double in brightness. This is a famous one, Supernova 1987A. It took place in a galaxy near ours. And we can see a before and after image. And here, before the arrow points to the star, observed to explode in 1987. Of course, when this picture was taken, they had no idea that the star was about to explode. But then there was this bright light right to, uh, up and to the left of my pointer. The supernova appeared as a bright point of light. It's the closest supernova in the last four centuries. And it was very good. It gave good scientific data because it was the first time with good modern equipment that we we're able to observe a supernova up close. And we we're able to, by uh, measuring the radiation, the particles that came from it, we we're able to test a lot of theories that we had about what happens during a supernova. For example, when a proton and electron combine, this is what happens in the core of the star that's becoming a neutron star. Our theory always said that uh, it would all become neutrons and neutrinos would be kicked off. One way to test that theory would be if we were to observe a supernova up close, we should get a large stream of neutrinos. A large burst of neutrinos from this region, from supernova 1987a, confirm the theory that a neutron star is formed during a supernova. That is the end of high mass stars. Now, the very highest mass stars, and not in a neutron star, but actually something called a black hole. So a neutron star is held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. Gravity is crushing in and the neutrons are jammed together, holding up against gravity. But if the star is very, very massive, it is possible that the neutron degeneracy pressure cannot hold up against gravity, and then the entire star will just crush down to zero size. It is what I think is one of uh, the most bizarre objects in the universe, a black hole. And we will talk more about these things in chapter 18, the bizarre stellar graveyard. So we'll talk about white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. As I conclude this video, I wanna look at these intermediate mass stars. So in my part one video for chapter 17, I looked at the life of low mass stars. They end in white dwarfs. And we have just looked at high mass stars greater than eight solar masses. They end as neutron stars or black holes. But now I wanna look at these intermediate mass stars. An intermediate mass stars end is like that of a low mass star. So if you think back to what you learned in my part one video, a low mass star uh, when Well, all stars, when they're main sequence, they fuse hydrogen into helium in their core. A low mass star will fuse helium into carbon, and that's where the story ends. The outer layers just float away, and you're left with a white dwarf that is carbon. An intermediate mass star continues the story beyond carbon, just like a high mass star does. However, it will just, it's like a low mass star, it just ends the story a few chapters later. So it's got enough mass to crush down on the carbon core to fuse it into oxygen. Then when all that core is oxygen, the nuclear fusion will shut down, gravity will contract the star, and it'll crush down on it and fuse that oxygen into neon. At this point, it will behave like a low mass star where it'll expand so large that the outer layers will just float away and you're left with a, um, a white dwarf 
that is neon, or if it didn't get that far, maybe oxygen. But you're still left with a white dwarf. It's just with having had more advanced elements in that core. And so here we have a planetary nebula, the kind you would see from the end of an intermediate mass star, just like with a low mass star. And at the very center of it, you can see the, the white dwarf, which is the leftover core of the star. In this video, what have we learned? What are the life stages of a high mass star? They are similar to the life stages of a low mass star. However, this, the story has more chapters to it. It goes uh, on as it fuses heavier and heavier elements. How do high mass stars make the elements necessary for life? Higher masses of the stars produce higher core temperatures than they enable fusion of heavier elements. And how does a high mass star die? Its iron core collapses leading to a supernova. And what is left over of that core is either a neutron star or in some extreme cases, a black hole. That is the end of part two, the life of a high mass star. Have a great day.